Hi everyone, Ross Satchel from Microchip back again. In the previous video in this series, we toggled the onboard user LED every one second using the delay function. In this video, we will toggle the onboard LED by pulling the interrupt status flag of timer counter A. So at the end of the previous video, I mentioned that the delay function is a blocking function. So let's talk about that for a moment. A piece of code is known as blocking if it prevents other code from being executed. In the case of the delay function, the code can only count down the wait time until it is zero, and only then can it move on. If something were to happen while the delay function was running, it would be missed as the CPU is fully occupied counting down the delay. This is sometimes known as a busy wait as it uses CPU cycles. So how do we get around this? The solution is to use non-blocking operations. By utilizing hardware peripherals, which only use CPU resources to set up the peripheral, we can then free up CPU resources after our initial setup. One way of using non-blocking operations for LED blinking is to set a timer to overflow, say, every one millisecond. When it overflows, it sets an interrupt flag, and we can use that flag to increment a counter to count the number of overflows. When it reaches 1000, that is 1000 milliseconds, or one second, we can toggle the LED. This requires digging into the data sheet a little more. So let's get started. Start by connecting your ATtiny1627 to your host computer and create a new bare metal project. If you have issues with the kit window not appearing, please refer to video one in this series. If you can't remember how to create a new bare metal project and main.c file, please refer to video 2 in this series. Now let's open the data sheet to section 21, which is timer counter A. We can see that timer counter A, also known as TCA, is a 16-bit counter with three compare channels. It can count events, do timer overflow interrupts, and can also be split into two 8-bit timers. It has double buffered timer period setting and compare channels. In the overview, it tells us that it consists of a base counter and a set of compare channels. The base counter can be used to count clock cycles or events. It has direction control and a period setting for timing purposes. Depending on the mode in use, the counter is cleared, reloaded, incremented or decremented at each timer counter clock input. TCA can be clocked and timed from the peripheral clock with prescaling available. Then the block diagram in section 21.2 covers TCA quite well. Let's start with the top block, the base counter. We can see period buffer and period register making up the double buffer. Then on the right side, we have the control logic, which uses registers control A and control B to set up the clock and mode. We won't be using the event action in this example. The control logic can alter the counter by counting, loading, clearing, or setting its direction. Depending on the configuration, when the timer reaches either the top value or zero, an interrupt flag can be generated. Then if we consider the compare units, of which there are three on this device, firstly, we can see the double buffered compare channels. So when the counter matches the value in the compare channel, we can also generate an interrupt. Additionally, we can also output a waveform. Next, we have some important definitions that we'll be using. So let's jump to the functional description. So bottom is defined when the counter reaches zero in hex. Max is when the counter reaches FFFF in hex. Top is when the counter is equal to the highest value in the count sequence. This is user defined. We won't use update in this application. CNT is the counter register value, and CMP is the compare register value. And finally, PER is the period register value. So if we want TCA to overflow every one millisecond, we need to figure out how to do that. 
You may recall from the previous video, we were looking at the clock controller to work out our CPU frequency. This time, we need to know the peripheral clock frequency. So let's open the datasheet to section 11 clock controller again. The block diagram in section 11.2 shows the 20 MHz oscillator, which is gated by a main clock switch and then goes through a prescaler. It has two dedicated outputs, one for the CPU, RAM, and non-volatile memory, while the other is for peripherals and also has a clock out available. So then our peripheral clock will be the same as our CPU clock, and we found that was 3.333333 megahertz. If you're unsure how we got that, please refer to the previous video in the series. Now it's time for some math. If we have that clock frequency, then the clock period is the inverse, which is 300 nanoseconds. Next, we want a one millisecond timer, and we have a 300 nanosecond clock period. So we need to know how many times 300 nanoseconds goes into one millisecond. The answer is 3,333.33 recurring. Since we can only enter an integer value into the period register, we will truncate it to 3,333. Now to the data sheet, section 21, timer counter A. In the functional description, we have a basic initialization procedure. We need to set the period register. We need to check the prescaler is set to one, so our math works out. And we need to enable the peripheral. Then there's a section on normal operation that tells us the counter direction is set by the direction bit in the control E register, so we'll need to check that too. Then there's some sections on double buffering, changing the period, using the compare channels, PWM, splitting into two timers, events, ah, and this is what I'm looking for, interrupts. The available interrupt sources in normal 16-bit mode are overflow or underflow and compare channel interrupts. Note the abbreviation for overflow is OVF. Now we have enough to set up TCA for one millisecond interrupts. Jumping back to MPLAB X, we need to set up the port pin for the LED just like we did last time. It's on pin PB7. So we need to use the port B direction register and pin 7 macro. Now we want to set up timer counter A. I will follow the basic initialization procedure outlined before. But before we do that, we should take a look at the header file. Include it as we did in the previous video then control click to follow it. If you're unclear about how I found the header file, please refer to video two in this series. Now control F to find and enter TCA underscore into the search field. Under TCA, there are two structs, one for single mode and the other for split mode where the 16-bit timer is split into two 8-bit timers. We will be using the single mode, and that is part of the macro name. Normally I go through the registers in order, but the control A register contains the enable bit, and I want to set that last after I set everything else up, because that starts the timer counting. The control A register also has the prescaler for TCA, and we can see that its value upon reset is zero, which corresponds to a prescaler of one. So we don't need to do anything there. On to control B register. It has the compare channel enable bits, but we're not using those. Then there's the timer waveform generation mode. I want normal mode, where the period register is the top, and it overflows at the top when counting up. So we can use the group configuration macro for that. TCA0 
dot single dot control B equals TCA underscore single underscore WG mode underscore and press control space and we can see the group configurations at the bottom. We want normal mode. Control C has the output values for the compare channels and Control D has split mode. We're not using either of those. Then there's Control E. We just need to check the direction bit to make sure the timer is counting up. We can see that it defaults to zero, which is counting up, so we don't need to do anything. Now we just need to set the period register with the value we calculated and enable the timer. The period register is a 16-bit register, so in our code, we can just write to the whole register without specifying the high or low byte. Let's just jump back to the header file to confirm we know what we're doing. Control F to search and enter TCA underscore in case you cleared it from before. You may notice some variables of the type underscore word register. If you look closely, they are registers that the user can write a word to, for example, the period buffer or the compare zero value. If we control and click to see what they are, we can see they're a union of a register 16 underscore T and two register eight underscore T variables. Then as you may recall from the last video, a register eight underscore T as an unsigned eight bit integer and we can see that register 16 underscore T, if we control click to follow it, is an unsigned 16 bit integer. So we can set our period register by typing TCA0 dot single and then a P for period. And then we can click on the period register entry. Now we can set it equal to our calculated value of 3333 in decimal. Then we need to enable the interrupt for the timer counter A overflow, which is in the int control register. We can use the OVF bitmask macro as follows. First we tell it which register we're writing to, and then the bitmask we're using. So the line of code is TCA0 dot single dot int control equals TCA underscore single underscore OVF bitmask. Finally, we can start the timer with the enable bit in the control A register. TCA0 dot single dot control A equals TCA underscore single underscore enable bitmask. That's it for the timer counter A setup. So now we have set up our timer and set the LED as an output. Now we need some code to decide whether it's time to toggle the LED. The particular method we're going to employ in this video is known as polling. A simple analogy would be, let's say you were at home and your friend is coming over, but you don't know when, and you don't have a doorbell. So you get up from the couch every five minutes and check the front door. If your friend is not there, you go sit back down and check again in five minutes, until eventually your friend is there. Again, this method is known as polling. The other method that can be used for this is known as interrupts, which is analogous to your friend ringing the doorbell. So in our while one loop, we need to check if the overflow interrupt flag for TCA has been set. To do this, we should use an if statement. In it, we need to bitwise AND the TCA interrupt flags or int flags register with the TCA overflow macro. It's the same macro we use to set the int control register. Let's quickly check the data sheet to see if we need to reset the TCA overflow bit in the in flags register once it is overflowed. There's a note saying that the OVF or overflow flag 
is not automatically cleared and that we need to write a 1 to that bit to clear it. To write a 1 to that bit, we can use the OR equals operator. So it's TCA0 dot single dot int flags OR equals TCA underscore single underscore OVF bitmask. And also we want to increment a counter. But which data type should we use for our counter variable? Since it's counting from 0 up to some positive number, we should make it unsigned. But then, how big is big enough? Well, an unsigned 8-bit integer can count from 0 to 255. That won't be sufficient as we want to count to 1000, that is, 1000 milliseconds. A 16-bit unsigned integer can count from 0 to 65,535. That's enough to count for over 65 seconds, which is more than enough. Then in an if statement, we can check the counter variable. If it has met or exceeded our required delay of 1000, that is 1000 milliseconds, we can toggle the LED and reset the counter to zero. So each time through the while one loop, we pull the counter. If it has reached 1000, that is our 1000 milliseconds, we toggle the LED. If it hasn't, then we do nothing. So now let's build the project and program the device. If you get an error saying attempt to include more than one avr forward slash ioxxx.h file, then you need to comment out the header file at the top of the main.c file as we're just using it to access the header file. Now let's build the project and program the device. We can see the programming complete message in the lower pane, and now we can see our LED is toggling every 1000 milliseconds, or one second. Congratulations, you've successfully built a bare metal project that pulls a timer peripheral. In the next video, we'll set up a project that does this all in interrupts, freeing the CPU up to do other things.